Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And uh, I've entitled the message today, uh, I've entitled the message, The Superiority or the Supremacy of Yushia's Rest. The Supremacy of Yushia's Rest. And uh, there are five points that I want to, uh, to just say right up front. What it means when it says rest here, what in the world is writer of Hebrews talking about? Uh, he's talking about that uh, the thing that happened with God himself when God created the world, the universe. He created the whole universe in six days, and on the Sabbath he rested. And so when it talks about the rest here, it's talking about that. It's also talking about the rest that was promised to the Israelites after they, uh, after they were delivered from bondage uh, in Egypt and as they uh, were headed towards the land of Canaan, the promised land, the rest that was going to be given to them. But it also goes back to the garden, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we uh, develop the sermon today. But uh, John Owens, one of those great, wonderful, uh, Puritan writers, uh, he pointed out that rest here, R-E-S-T, that rest here, that it uh, has it has five. Oh, I hate this. Okay, he points out that there are five there are five features of the rest of biblical rest that's being spoken of here in chapter 3 and then in chapter 4 of, uh, of the book of Hebrews. Number one, rest means peace with God. And oh God, and oh peace. And oh Jesus, and oh peace. K-N-O Jesus, K-N-O Jesus, peace. You know, if you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, you'll know peace. But if you don't have Jesus, there is no peace. So number one, peace, rest means peace with God. Second, rest means being free from our slavery to sinfulness. We're all sinaholics. We all need to be delivered from our propensity to sin. We're all we all have the propensity to break all ten of the commandments. And so the first thing is the, the, that uh, there is the peace of God. That's what rest means. The second thing, rest means being delivered from the slavery that we have by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're delivered to worship God, to glorify God, and to enjoy Him forever. So that's the second thing. The third thing, rest means deliverance from the burden of the Mosaic Law. You know, the first five books of the Bible, you know, we talk about the Ten Commandments, but man, there are, there are a whole bunch of uh, laws there in the, uh, the first five books of the Bible in the Torah. And the Mosaic Law, I mean, it was, you know, all of these kosher laws, Jesus fulfilled all of that. Jesus perfectly fulfilled it. He didn't destroy it, he fulfilled it. So our rest that's promised here, the rest that's being talked about here in Hebrews, is being delivered from this incredible burden of keeping up with all those laws, you know, that you can't eat this mixed with that and all that kind of stuff. Okay, the fourth thing, rest means freedom of worship according to the gospel. Freedom to worship according to the gospel. And the gospel is all about grace and truth. And it's the balance of grace and truth. That's why I said this morning, uh, a while ago when we opened, that uh, the Word, the Word, the Son of God, capital W, Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the gospel. All right, fifth, rest here means rest that God himself enjoys. Think about that for a minute. 
this rest that's being spoken of here is the kind of rest that God himself had on the seventh day after creation. We get to have that same kind of rest. That kind of godly, holy rest. That's what he's talking about. Now, rest does not mean doing nothing. It means, it means being able to do all the things that God wants us to do, and there's no frustration about it. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create them to sit around and do nothing. He created them to tend the garden. He work was part of part and parcel of the whole reason that he created Adam and Eve. He created them to take care of the earth. It's called the creation mandate. But what this rest is meaning here in Hebrews, it means that we're, there's no more frustration. When Adam and Eve sinned and they were kicked out of the garden, there were several things that God said were going to happen. One of the things that said, your work is sometimes going to be futile. You're going to have to deal with thorns and thistles, and uh, your labor sometimes is just going to be futile. And childbirth is going to be painful. So, the rest that we have here is going to be, we're going to go back to the garden. John Milton wrote a wonderful poem, Paradise Lost, but he also wrote another one, Paradise Regained. What this rest is talking about is paradise being regained. Now, let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as we march through the uh, book of Hebrews, Hebrews, as we've said over and over again, is a long sermon exhortation. It is an encouragement and it's a warning. It's an encouragement to, to do those things of the power of the Holy Spirit that God created us to do. And it's a warning, don't fail to do that. It's a warning, last week we, uh, we uh, had the warning, do not harden your heart. And uh, last week we, uh, we, we, we saw in chapter three that Jesus is superior to Moses, but then it goes into this whole thing about do not harden your heart as the Israelites did in the wilderness. You know, they were so happy, they were so uh, so joyful to be delivered, you know, to be delivered from slavery in Egypt. They escaped, you know, this fabulous escape, and even the Egyptians were paying them to leave. Gave them all this gold and silver and said, Get out of here. We don't want you here anymore. And then, of course, uh, Pharaoh had a change of heart. Uh, Pharaoh was a little fickle. He was uh, kind of wishy-washy there. And he decided, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, our, all our slaves are leaving. And uh, so he panicked there and he decided to chase them down. And he caught them uh, at the Red Sea. And God parted the Red Sea. And the Israelites escaped again. And uh, the Pharaoh... Pharaoh's army was destroyed. And so, you know, they get to the other side. And so, at this point, the Israelites, you know, there's like over a million people that we're talking about here. They're very happy. They're, they're joyful. You know, they are definitely believing in God. The problem is, they're not definitely believing God. And there's a huge difference from believing in God and believing God. Today is uh, Palm Sunday. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the, the uh, last week of his earthly life here before he was crucified uh, later in the week, uh, as he came in on Sunday, on the first day of the week as he came in, the people, 
you know, they remembered, hey, this is the guy been doing all these miracles. This guy that fed, fed, fed 5,000 people. Hey, this is the guy who, you know, he's special. He's, uh, he's like, why, well, just the other day, he raised this guy. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Man, he must be something. And so as Jesus comes in on the, the uh, donkey and, uh, uh, you know, the people are like, they get uh, palm branches and they take their costly robes and they throw it into the road. The road, uh, you know, they create a carpet for Jesus and they cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. You know, they, they were believing in God. They were even believing in Jesus at that point, but they did not believe God. They did not believe Jesus because Jesus had claimed to be the Messiah. They believed in the miracles. They believed in all the good stuff. But it's like, mm, he's not exactly he's not exactly the flavor of Messiah that I that I anticipated. He's not going to overthrow the Roman government. And that's what we really want. We want to get rid of the pesky Romans. But uh, they definitely they were believing in, in God. They were believing in Jesus, but they didn't believe in him. Or else, these same people that were crying Hosanna on the first day of the week, on Thursday, on Friday, they were crying, crying crucify him, crucify him. A little bit fickle there, huh? What do you think? Um, okay, so it talks about this risk that's promised to the Israelites as they go into Canaan, uh, as, they, as they're escaping the slavery there in Egypt, and they have the promise of the promised land, and uh, they're looking forward to this, and yet what happens is while they're out there in the wilderness, God decides, hey, I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them the Ten Commandments. I'm going to give them an instruction book, a really important part of the instruction book of how to be a human as I intended you to be. How to be the human that glorifies me and enjoys me forever. So God calls Moses to go up on Mount Sinai and to receive the, uh, the Ten Commandments and while he's up there, the people, you know, they were believing in God but they did not believe God. And so while Moses was up there, they got all anxious. You know, it says over and over again in the scriptures not to be anxious. You know what it means to be anxious? It means unbelief. It means not believing that God is really sovereign. Charles Spurgeon said something like this. He said, when you go through trials and tribulations, the pillow that you can rest your head on and give rest is the sovereignty of God. God is in control, not just of this world, not just of our lives, he's in control of the universe. He's the God who created the universe. That's our God, that's the God of life. And so, while Moses is up there, they get all antsy and they're like, oh my goodness. And uh, they start thinking about, oh, the onions and the leeks. When we were in Egypt, we had onions and leeks. We had fish to eat and we had melons to, to eat. And oh my goodness. And, 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 and we knew what, you know, we, we saw those uh, gods that the Egypt, Egyptians were worshiping. We could see them. And, and what we, we must need a God ourselves. So, you know, they call upon Aaron to take the gold and the silver that they were paid to leave Egypt with, and he takes and he makes a golden calf. And so they're worshiping the golden calf when, when Moses comes down off the mountain and uh, he sees this and it makes, makes Moses so angry he throws down the ten, ten the stones, he throws down the ten, uh, Ten Commandments that are written in stone breaks them. Because they're, they obviously broke every one of the Ten Commandments by creating this golden calf. 
and uh, the wrath of God burned quite hot against those people. And uh, there was some horrible, horrible stuff that happened. Well, you know, then, you know, goes, Moses goes back up on Mount Sinai and gets a, a second copy. He gets a second copy of the uh, Ten Commandments on the tablets. And he comes back. And some of, some of the folks have kind of learned the lesson, you know, maybe sort of learned the lesson, but not really. You know, there, there's still a stiff-necked, hard-headed people. Now, some of them, there were some people amongst the million or so people there in the wilderness who really believed. And when you really believe, you're experiencing the rest that's spoken of here. The rest of knowing God is sovereign. He's still in control no matter how bad things look. And so, you know, you've got Caleb and you've got Joshua and Moses is still, you know, at this point, he's still a pretty strong believer in God. But then Moses screws up because he gets angry and uh, instead of doing what God wanted him to do, when the people said, hey, we're going to die of thirst out here in the desert, what, you know, what are you going to do about it? And Moses gets so ticked off, he strikes the rock instead of just touching the rock. He loses his temper, and it costs Moses. The price that Moses had to pray was Moses didn't go, get to go into the promise, promised land. In fact, when they finally get to Canaan, after 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, a whole generation has died. All that million plus people that came out of Egypt, every single one of the Israelis, or the Israelites who came out of Egypt, every single one of them died out there in the wilderness, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Think about that. Because Joshua and Caleb actually really believed God. They really believed in God's sovereignty. They did not, they did not fall into that pit of unbelief. And unbelief, unbelief is a very serious crime against God. It's treason against God. Now, the superiority that's spoken of here, the word Joshua actually is the uh, same word that we get translated into uh, into the uh, Greek language as Jesus. So Joshua and Jesus, they mean the same the same thing. They mean salvation is of the Lord. And so Yeshua, which is the Hebrew for Jesus, Yeshua means salvation is of the Lord. So the rest that is spoken of here and that. Uh, that the writer of Hebrews is speaking of here, the rest that we're promised, the rest that the believers in Jesus Christ were promised, is even superior to the rest that was promised back in the Old Testament. It is superior to the rest there because it is the perfect rest of paradise restored, paradise regained. Jesus is going to restore everything, is going to make the universe right. Right now, the universe is out of whack. And it's out of whack because of man's sinfulness. Because of man's unbelief. So again, the writer of Hebrews warns us, he warns the, uh, the original audience of the Jewish believers in Jesus Christ and the first uh, century AD and the first uh, Christian uh, era, he warns them against unbelief. Do not harden your hearts. Do not fall into the sin, sin of hardening your hearts, of unbelief. Stop being anxious. Stop complaining. Believe that God is going to provide more than 
more than anything we can even imagine for our good. Jesus, Jesus paid the price to wash away our sin and he calls us to be resurrected, to be alive again. Not to be dead in our trespasses and sin, but be alive and to enjoy that perfect rest, the rest which everything that we do, it doesn't mean you're going to sit around and do nothing. The rest means that you're going to get to do work. You're going to get to do good works that God created us in, in, uh, in order for us to do. But everything is going to be, everything is going to actually be productive. We're not going to do things that are futile. Everything that we do is going to work out. You know, that's amazing. So, he also talks about today. In this passage, he talks about today. Today. Do not harden your heart today, but rather believe today. And if you haven't ever confessed your sin and professed Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, and you're not looking forward to that rest that is promised in, in our salvation, Today, today is the day to do it. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this promised rest. We thank you that Jesus paid the price on the, on the cross of Calvary and that he is going to restore the universe to be exactly what you wanted it to be in the first place. That we are going to, we are going to experience the eternal rest of the new heavens and the new earth. What a glorious thought. We ask that you bless us so we might look forward to that. We might be looking forward with all of our being to that blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That blessed rest that he promises here. We ask this in Jesus' name for his sake and his glory. Amen.